Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. You'll also find our archives where you can listen to every episode we've ever done going back to 2006. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is July 6, 2016, and my guest is Matthew Futterman, Wall Street Journal reporter and author of Players, the story of sports and money and the visionaries who fought to create a revolution, which is our topic for today. Matt, welcome to Econ Talk. Thanks so much for having me. So your book is a fascinating and incredibly entertaining look at a real revolution, how a sleepy part of our lives called sports became a multi-multi-billion dollar behemoth, sometimes a monster, uh, sometimes something very glorious. Uh, what changed? Uh, obviously, a lot of things changed, but sometime between the 1950s and today, and it came at different times for different sports, but something changed. And it runs through your book. What is that? Well, I think what what really changed was uh, the athlete, um, the people who are the real subjects of the book. That's why I called it players. Um, they really started agitating and they started pushing uh, to be paid as professionals and to be paid what they were worth um, and what you would pay uh, the, 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 the so-called sort of star of the show. And once they started being paid as professionals, um, they got enough money uh, to be able to work harder and train harder and get better at what they did. And once they did that, the, the products got a lot better, meaning that, you know, the shows they were putting on, the performances, and more people wanted to come see them and more people wanted to pay money to put them on TV, and the whole system sort of snowballed from there. But what it really starts with uh, was, you know, paying the labor force what it deserved to be paid and valuing it uh, in the way it deserved to be valued. And that sort of seems to have been the thing that uh, really unlocked the box of sports. I think what's been said for a long time, what was always said for a long time, was that uh, TV made sports. And you know that is true to some extent. TV, you know, is supplies the the lifeblood is is really the lifeblood of sports. Um, but sports had to become good TV because before TV could make sports. Yeah, that's a fantastic insight. You know, if you had asked me before I read your book, why do athletes make so much money today compared to say 1950? I would have said something like, "Well, TV came along." It gave them exposure, allowed them to entertain a lot more people than they could have before. And eventually, of course, it went global through the Internet. And so that opportunity to be a part of that much larger market is why sports got bigger. And a bunch of labor relations, decisions, strikes, et cetera, gave athletes a bigger share of that pie over time. And that's really the story. And I, what I learned from your book that I found so interesting was to appreciate that synergy you just talked about, how the – I mean, it's obvious we all know that is when you can make $10 million playing something rather than 25000 more people are going to try to do it and to do it well. But I didn't think enough about how the product itself changed. You know, you go back and look at basketball players in the 60s, and they look funny. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, go try and I, I always tell people, you know, when we start having this kind of, this kind of these kinds of conversations, and uh, because it's sports, it inevitably um, gets into a sort of debate and argument. Everybody's and an I expert, always, you're right? And I always <laughs> tell people, and everybody should be an expert. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's not, like, there's no, that's that's one of, that's the thing that's great about sports is you know I don't necessarily know anything more about it than anybody else does. Uh, I write about it a little more than most than, than other people do, and probably think about it too much for my own good. Um, but you know, it, it, what what I tell them is, you know, go back and watch, uh, you know, a Super Bowl from the 1980s, um, the, you know, a game that you thought was great, uh, you know, from from a generation or two ago, and tell me if you can sit through it because it, it's it's slow 
the equipment is strange, the players aren't moving very quickly, uh, and they and they, you say they look funny. They are completely different bodies at work there, uh, and it's that's not you know the the species hasn't changed. You know, evolution yeah. didn't <laughs> suddenly change over the last thirty years. That we know that didn't happen. What happened was was training and practice and all these things that people didn't have time for uh, because in the 50s, Arnold Palmer was a paint salesman uh, in addition to trying to become a professional golfer. And Roger Staubach was selling real estate in the offseason when he was the, the, the starting quarterback of the Dallas Cowboys. Uh, you know, all these things that took up people's time rather than uh, things like, you know, watching what you eat and going for a run and going to the weight room and doing all kinds of other exercises and sleeping, for instance. Um, You know, things that are all incredibly important to what we know as sort of modern athletes. And that's where you get Steph Curry and that's where you get LeBron James uh, and any number of other athletes. You know, it doesn't just, it doesn't just happen. But I think, but to take the, your point, uh, further, I think the that's only part of the story, and that's the part that I understood. That's the part I knew, and certainly as an economist, looking at the incentives, uh, players want to play longer. You know, when you can when you can get a decent multi million dollar contract in your late thirties, obviously you have an incentive to stay in shape and not get overweight and to keep your body healthy. And we, we all under, that part's pretty straightforward. The part that I didn't appreciate is the part that. It's not just that the bodies are different, which, you know, it's, it's the difference really. LeBron James is almost a comic book uh, character in his physique compared to, well, he is compared to a 1950s basketball player who looks something close to me. Uh, and I don't look so good. So, you know, that's part of it. But the other part is when you watch that Super Bowl game from 1980 or better, 1970, uh, the camera angles aren't so interesting. Uh, replay isn't as interesting. And most importantly, and this is what your book really, I think, brings out, uh, we don't have, we did not have the emotional connection that we have today. Now, to some extent, that's an old story, right? Obviously, people loved, uh, they loved Babe Ruth. They loved Ted Williams. They loved uh, Will Chamberlain and Bill Russell. They loved these older figures. They, They were they were stars. They were celebrities of enormous proportion. But the marketing of both the player and the product, the game itself, radically changed in the last 20-something years, correct? Yeah, I think that's fair to say. Certainly, certainly uh – you know, I, it might stretch it out to 30 years, and um, you know, in the 80s, and then the early and mid 80s with the with the with the, the onset of Michael Jordan and the burst, the the boom of of Nike, because then Nike really sort of set the tone for um, for marketing in the in the modern sports world. I and, think that's fair to say. Yeah, and that's a mystery to me. Uh, and we're going to come back to that, but. Just the idea that you wanted to package players. You know, a lot of people make – you talk about different myths about sports popularity. The standard myth about the NBA is that uh, Magic Johnson, Larry Bird came along. Their rivalry was exciting. They got to face against face off against each other multiple times. And then Michael Jordan took it to another level. And other sports have struggled to imitate that success. But that's the secret. And that is part of it, obviously. But as you point out, in other sports, uh, other things happened. Uh, football being the most interesting example for me, I would have given a similar story. But in that case, uh, rule change played a huge part. So talk about that. Yeah, well, the NFL um, in the 1970s, uh, we talked about it being hard to watch. It was really hard to score uh, in, the, in the late 70s. Um, I, you had years where – uh, you know, point totals where teams teams were scoring combined, you know, twenty points a game, and shutouts were becoming common. And uh, the the rules committee, the people that were running the NFL, just realized that this this just wasn't going to work. That people were come, people wanted to come to games and they wanted to see scoring. Uh, and so what they did was they changed the rules to open to to open up the field to make it easier essentially uh, to move the ball down the field. And what's the easiest way to move the ball down the field? It's through the forward pass. 
Uh, but but you couldn't do that under the old rules. The offensive linemen couldn't weren't couldn't extend their arms when they were supposed to be blocking. Um, if you could sort of imagine that, imagine trying to block J.J. Watt today without extending your arms. Uh, that was one. It was one real problem. The other problem was the wide receivers could essentially be assaulted on on the line of scrimmage, um, and as they moved downfield, and it, that rule changed where you couldn't have contact uh, beyond five yards. And it, and that really opened things up. Um, but what the NFL realized also was uh, it, the attention was going to have to shift from the sidelines to the field. And this has always been the league of Lombardi. And then it became the league of Montana. Uh, and so it went from being a coach's league to a quarterback's league. And that's what we see today. When you think of the NFL today, you think of you think of Andrew Luck, and uh, you think of Peyton Manning. Although you don't think you're not going to think of Peyton Manning anymore. Um, yeah, I think about Tom uh, Brady, man. So just right FYI. In, uh, yeah. Okay. Just let you know where I stand. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, but uh, you know that's the, the quarterbacks run. This is this is a quarterbacks league. The quarterbacks run the league. This the well, quarterbacks that think, starts the show, and that is not in any way an accident. It's because it's because that's the game they made. That's the game they created. And if you believe in markets, and I mostly do. Um, Certainly, that's the game that people like, and that's the game that people have wanted to see. Yeah, and I think you know it's one thing to say that the rule change did this, or that the league has has promoted quarterbacks in various ways, which they have. Uh, but but the the obvious way to see it is that very rarely does a team with a mediocre quarterback go very far uh, in, in football these days. Everyone understands that a quarterback's a really important position. Uh, it's not really up up for debate. Uh, and of course, the the blind side. Michael Lewis's book is about the fact that protecting the quarterback is really important. Uh, yeah, and among other things, I think, uh, what I think is 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 really important is that um, you know the NFL sort of they, they sort of happened. The rule changes were very deliberate and. But then you had these sort of – you had a coach like Bill Walsh out in San Francisco that could really sort of see where this was going. And he was the first one to really take advantage of the rule changes very quickly and understand uh, how the game was going to change. And he not only adapted how the team was going to play – on Sundays, but he adapted how the team practiced. You know, he stopped having contact. He stopped stopped wearing down. He stopped wearing down his players. He wanted them fresh, and he wanted them fast, and he wanted them speedy, and he wanted them healthy. And so you can see how a few rule changes, and it, when you change the emphasis of the game, um, how the people who are really thinking about it quickly and thinking ahead and thinking about the impact of these things, how. Uh, how they can adapt. And, you know, what I really wanted to do with this book was I wanted to sort of show how the decisions and um, the money, uh, the things that, you know, sort of we, that take place off the field, how it really affected what happened on the field and how that's what really made sports. Um, you know, nothing really happens by accident anymore. And uh, certainly, certainly that's 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 true in sports. Yeah. And, I, you know, th- this happens in every sport uh, to some extent. If you look at baseball, 1968, um, I think Carly Stremsky led the American League with a 300 batting average, but it was really 299 something and they rounded it up Um uh, Bob right. Gibson. It was the year, the Bob year of the pitcher. Bob right. Gibson's ERA was, I think, was one point one two, and so they realized, oh, this isn't good for the game. It's good for pitchers, not so good for batters, and really bad for the game because people like scoring. So what did they do? They lowered the pitcher's mound, and I think they also subtly, in various ways, over time, changed the strike zone. You know, it's nominally from the knees to the arm. They, it went from the knees to the shoulders, and they changed it knees to the armpits. It's really waste. <laughs> Uh, right. Almost to the to the nipples. Way to the belly it's really yeah. Uh, it's a very narrow zone, which makes it much easier for for batters. And so that's what baseball did. Basketball introduced the three point line. 
Uh, and those three sports, football, baseball, basketball, all became much more uh, offensive and much less defensive. And other sports, though, didn't change. So, like, the most obvious one is uh, soccer. So soccer, you know, a lot of games end 0-0. Zero, zero. And Americans find that incredibly frustrating. I don't know if there's something wrong with us, right with us, but to me, part of the challenge of soccer becoming more popular in the United States is is that fact that scoring is relatively rare. Well, I do think that, I mean, I, I think there is, yeah, scoring is somewhat rare. And I, and I will admit that as I get older, um, I find myself much more drawn to the sports where it's harder to score. Yeah. Uh, I see find myself, I mean, I, I, I watch a lot of NFL. I can't, everybody does. Um, and, and even though it is, it is getting increasingly hard to score in baseball, I find myself watching less baseball just because the ball is in play so rarely these days. And I think it's become increasingly boring. Uh, but, you know, to, to get away from that and to get back to your original question about soccer, you know, I, they, week in, week out, um, the the soccer games that are played at the top professional uh, leagues in Europe are also pretty much unrecognizable from where they were 25 and 30 years ago. And if you talk about them not changing, you know, maybe the size of the field is the same, is the same, and the goals are the same size, um, but it's a completely different ball. The fields are much more manicured, cured, you know, it, it used to be maybe a couple of teams would have beautiful fields and everyone else would be playing on sort of ruddy, muddy grass. Um, now everybody has a field that's uh, sort of like a pool table. The fields are watered down before to make them even faster. Uh, they have made tremendous changes to speed up those games as well. Um, and they score goals. I mean, there are the occasional zero zero games, but you know, uh, you much more often. And uh, you know, I would encourage anyone who who has sort of a knee jerk reaction against soccer at this point to um, to watch this. You know, beginning in the fall, these English Premier League games on Saturdays and Sunday mornings that NBC uh, does such a great job of showing, and it's the real challenge actually for. Um, the soccer league in the U.S. is not so much competing against the other U.S. sports. It's competing against uh, the great soccer from Europe that's now, because of you know media, uh, so available to all of us. But those games are like the NFL. They are you know they they are fast. There is scoring and also um, completely almost unrecognizable from where they were a generation ago. Well, and I think there's a I mean just a huge increase in in casual interest in the United States, partly because of the availability. And of course, but that's a simultaneous phenomenon. People are, it's available because people are interested. So I think it probably will continue to grow. I don't know if it'll ever get into the pantheon for Americans of major sports, but it's sure getting close. Uh, even if it's just following European teams, it's, there's a lot yeah, more passion the, out yeah, there. The, you know, the smart people that I talk to, they sort of think that um, in 20 years, the big, uh, the big sports in the U.S. will be the NFL, the NBA, and international soccer, English Premier, which are, you know, whether it's English Premier League or Spanish, probably English Premier League because they're the best position and the richest at this point, and will probably for the foreseeable future continue to have the best players. Although with this whole Brexit thing, that's sort of a bit thrown up in the air, air. Yeah, it's up in the air. itself. But, um, but yeah, that's you know, and and you know, to their credit, they've. That didn't happen by accident either. I mean, early, late '80s, early '90s, uh, English soccer was a mess. The stadiums were terrible. Um, the it was they were, they were dangerous. Um, they were dangerous and dirty and unpleasant, and they were not the. It was not the haven uh, for international soccer players to go get rich. The, the players went to Italy at that point, Italy or Germany. Um, those were really the top leagues, and then. And uh, there was a lot of investment in England, investment in the stadiums, um, and some change and a reformation of the top league, uh, and an investment from uh, you know media companies, uh, you know Sky specifically. And once they had the money, um, they they were able to make these make not that they weren't professional before, but the players were just able to get much better. 
the quality was there, and the quality was able to improve. And there were, this, like I said before, the subtle rule and equipment changes uh, that has really made made the product much more appealing. What's different about the ball? It's a much livelier ball. It's it's almost like a volleyball now. Uh, it, it's 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 smoother. Um, you know the old ball that Pele was playing with, with all the you know the black and white hexagonals on it. Uh, it, it was sewn together um, in all those different pieces, hand sewn together in all those different pieces. Uh, it, it absorbed water so that if it ever rained, you know, all of a sudden that ball would sort of turn into a lead balloon. Um, this uh, the ball now is. It's, it, it's much more, it's much more synthetic <laughs> when you get down to it, and it, 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 the grooves are much more subtle, so it flies um, faster, and it flies much more, uh, it, it, much more unpredictably. So um, it, it'll, it, it can bend much. But it, players can really bend it, uh, and and it. it it, it moves um, in, just, in the air, and that's why you see that's why you see those crazy shots that really sort of spin around a wall and up into the corner of the goal. I just want to say, though, I do think that Pele would be a successful player today, even if he didn't train harder and didn't have more time. I th- he was, and similarly, there you know a lot of the players we were talking about that in the in from ages past could compete under uh, today's rules with today's fitness. Um, but I take the point, it's a, and it's a good point. I want to come back to something you said about Bill Walsh because I think it's an interesting example about how he changed training and he changed practice. One thing it seems to me that's the case is that in a lot of sports in the past, because it was so uncompetitive, because there was so little money at stake, uh, innovation was kind of rare. Uh, people were content to go with certain cultural rules of thumb about how you prepared for a game or how you prepared your team. And there wasn't a lot of innovation. And one thing I've noticed since um, more money is in sports is that being uh, stuck in your ways is a lot more costly. Uh, I like to think that racism is down in sports. And one of the reasons is because it's too expensive to be a racist. Um, And as sports has gotten a lot more profitable, it has reduced things like racism, but also things like, uh, well, that's the way it's always been done. So you see tremendous innovation in in basketball. You see it in uh, football, maybe a little bit in baseball. Uh, you see it in some ways in the, the range of pitches that a pitcher will now have uh, that's required to be successful has gotten larger. And certainly training has changed across all sports. And it's not enough to say, yeah, well, that's the way, you know, I don't lift weights because that's bad for baseball. Nobody thinks that anymore. And a lot of those cultural norms changed as the game got more profitable yeah it's 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 not just and it's it's training and it's also sort of player evaluation too um that is the i mean that's probably the real uh uh, the real the real innovation that's happened is you know the hunt for the secret data yeah. um the 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 thing the hunt for the, the those important numbers that will tell you um who is better than whom yeah, <laughs> um, for sure uh, who is better than who, I guess, the availability day of data has made being a fan so much more entertaining uh for those of us who are you know statistically oriented uh, and I think, again, for some sports, soccer being an obvious example, you don't get that profusion of statistics uh, that you get with baseball. And I think baseball, for all its flaws, has that appeal that I think will keep it going, although I agree with you, it's it's too slow. And I think these attempts to, quote, speed up the game, which have not been very successful, I think they need to do something a lot more radical. And I think they eventually will. What do you think of that? Yeah, I think they'll probably they're they're going to be forced to. Um, I, I just think that I, I think that very few uh, sports have the luxury of asking fans to spend three hours with them these days. Um, you know, football you do, but there's only sixteen games in a season. Um, so, and there's a lot of games going on at one time, and people are playing fantasy, so there's a lot of distraction going on uh, these days. So, it's sort of it's been able to it's been able to work for them. But you know, baseball is you know asking fans to pay attention for at least three hours, or for give or, give or take a couple of minutes, three hours, yeah. you know, at least three hours, 162 times a year. Um, 
in today's world, that's a, that's, that's a big ask. But it's more, uh, and it's more than a, that. It's just what happens on the field needs to be yeah, sped there's up so to. Many, it's, it's unfortunate. There's so many simple things that, that can be done that they seem averse uh, that they seem averse to, do, to doing. Um, and, I mean, the first thing, you, you just, you just got to get rid of those mound conversations. Um, you get rid of those. Yep. <laughs> uh, if you want, if you want to change pitchers, you know, signal if manager stays in the dugout, stands up on the top step, says, "You come out, you come in," and the, then the pitching and the change happens. Um, you know, just like that, you can shave several minutes off the game. Uh, they've done a pretty, They've gotten better about not letting people step outside of the batter's box. Uh, they've gotten better, a little better about forcing pitchers to pitch. They could do much, but they could do much more. Um, that is the one thing. If you watch a game from 50 years ago. It's striking how quickly the pitchers pitch and how quick, you know, it's, it's ball goes back to the pitcher, ball is thrown. Ball goes back to the pitcher, ball is thrown. Uh, it's really striking, and that's something well, that I'm not sure when it? exactly they got away from it, maybe with Ricky Henderson adjusting his batting glove every, every, after every pitch, but it was something, something disastrous happened over the last, you know, 20 or 30 years where, well, I think where that- they lost control of it. Yeah, but I think that, that slowdown is partly a result of the money because – Oh, anyone at bats a lot more important now. Uh, anyone pitches a lot more important. So people know that their statistics matter. So there's just a lot more care into each at bat and each pitch. And so they go through a bunch of rituals to to get themselves in the right frame of mind, either as a pitcher or batter. And we're just, I think baseball is just going to have to change that from the top down. I think, I mean, an amazing example this year was the discussion of whether an intentional walk should be, uh, you shouldn't have to throw four pitches. You should just say signal yeah. the person going to first. And it really illustrates the point I'm trying to make about tradition. A lot of people are offended by that. They're not just like, I don't know if that's a good idea. It's like, how dare they do that? How dare – sometimes that walk that, – that pitch goes wide and, and sometimes – I think I've seen that I think I've seen that once, once in maybe, my life. Maybe I have once. Wa- I, I know I have seen it once. I don't think I have seen it twice. I've seen somebody and, swing at a pitch and hit a – put a ball in play unexpectedly. It's exciting once <laughs> – <laughs> right. Out of but thousands he, of right. times. Thousands of times and thousands of minutes. But that, it's bad. You know, we're it's, asked it's, to pay attention to the, most, uh, to the most predictable thing that could possibly happen. And what's more untraditional than changing the height of the mound So, or a designated hitter? These were all things done to bring more offense into baseball. And I think if baseball continues to decline as a uh, attraction, uh, they will – they'll change. These norms and these traditions will, will change. Uh, let's let's talk about uh, young uh, people, children, and how the amount of money in sports has changed the way that parents and their kids approach sports. And you use the example of Nick Boltieri's academy in tennis. Uh, what was his insight, and uh, how has it affected tennis and other sports? Well, I think his insight um, was similar to the insight. Uh, I, I guess I'll step back from him for one second just to sort of lead up to him. I mean, the original insight uh, was by the guy who's sort of credited with being the father of the modern sports industry, Mark McCormick, who I spent the first couple of chapters writing about. And, you know, one of his, he was sort of the first person to see this whole cycle working together of, you know, more money to the players, more time to practice, product gets better, more money into the system. And, the, you know, the, and, the, and the jobs become more desirable, more competition for the jobs, which creates, which makes the product even better. Um, but, uh, you know, so, so what Boletari saw was more money, well, the part where he saw was more money going into the system, tennis becoming professionalized. Um, which it really wasn't before 1968. Um, there was just a few tennis players because the tennis tour was uh, awful. Um, <laughs> to the extent that a professional tennis tour even existed, it was just a bunch of guys sort of barnstorming um, around the world. And his insight, once it got professionalized and more money was going into it, that more kids were going to want these jobs. Uh, and more parents were going to want these kids to have these jobs. Everybody was sort of up in arms the other day when Maya Dorado, uh, the very talented young swimmer um, for the U.S., she's 23, 24 years old, uh, went to Stanford, and after these Olympics isn't going to swim anymore because she has a job at McKinsey. 
And people can't imagine the idea that she's going to give up a job, a life as a professional swimmer um, to Those go are work. People. Like, to Those go are people work who have never thought much about what it's like to be a professional swimmer, I don't think. Right. <laughs> so, exactly. They haven't thought too much. And I can tell you, I can tell you that if the there morning. is one <laughs> – Oh, if there's one sport where the training and the practice is just absolute drudgery and just staring at that black line for hours and hours a day, it's swimming. So I can to- I can I can I can understand it. Um, but it, it it's it struck me as funny because uh, you know uh, thirty forty years ago, of course you wouldn't be a professional anything. Of course you'd take the job at McKinsey. Um, but Boletari saw that that was going to change. Uh, and that was changing. And so what he wanted to do um, was flip this American idea of being a well-balanced child um, and a well-balanced teenager and a well-balanced adult on its head. And, you know, if you're a teenager and your future was tennis, uh, then you should practice tennis eight or ten hours a day and Maybe go to school for three hours a day instead of the opposite ratio. Uh, and it was sort of blasphemy at the time. And now it's one of those things that is sort of like, well, yeah, of course. Um, and what's interesting about it is that it was, or it's always been interesting about it to me is that we have this, you know, we have this this sort of prejudice still against um, athletic prodigies doing this, doing that. It still exists. I, I can tell you it does because, you know, if, if in your neighborhood or on your street, there's some kid who's really good at something and he's spending all he's really good at, uh, you know, hockey or soccer or tennis or golf. And he enrolls in one of these programs and dedicates his life this way. You know, there is a certain amount of, of, of sort of, the parental judginess that will go on. Um, but if that kid is a great ballet dancer or a great pianist, we never say that kid shouldn't go to a conservatory. Um, no one ever judges the, the, the prodigies in, uh, I don't think in, in, in the arts or, um, in other pursuits, but there is something, uh, that I think people sort of, sort of still see, uh, as, as kind of crass about about doing that. Yeah. Um, well, I think the, the issue the there. It, it's fascinating that it that it's that it's that it happened and that it's um, the intensity of it. And I assume it's you know it's spread way beyond this phenomenon of just an academy. Of course, it's the travel team phenomenon that you write about. It's, it's just happening all through every level of sports. Yeah, it feeds. It feed, You know, it fed down. It started with the academy, but it sort of fed down to okay. Well, well now we'll get academies in every town, and you know, and and it's it, it. Yes, it, it sort of it created something of a of a of a lunatic system in some ways. So that even if your child isn't a great isn't a prodigy and, you know, like most of them probably will never even play for, you know, a division one college soccer team. Chances are her travel team that she's playing for, uh, has a coach who's ultra competitive and wants her to only play that game by the time she's 11 years old. So yeah, it does have its downsides, but yeah. And I think the other, the other part is, well, first there's the uncertainty, as you point out, I think, you know, an extraordinarily gifted musician, an extraordinarily gifted athlete. We're a little more understanding of this. The problem is the people who think, well, you know, there's a chance, so let's devote our lives to it. And a lot of people, of course, can't make it literally. It's just not going to happen. It can't be the case that every, there's only be one, uh, 10 top 10 tennis players uh, in the world at any one time. There's a, Hundred thousand who think they have a shot at it, and maybe a couple and of them only do. eighty, and only eighty of only about eighty of them make money these yeah. days. Uh, but I, you know, when you read a book like Open by uh, Agassi, which is a, I thought was really an amazing uh, biography, autobiography, the kind of book I normally wouldn't pick up, but it was I think I've mentioned it before on the air. Just a really gripping, fascinating read about all the different aspects of being a professional athlete. Uh, didn't seem so healthy for him, at least, to, to no, go through that experience. It, it, right. No, I think he's – and Andre is, you know, an incredibly self-conscious um, person and one of the smartest, least educated people uh, and really sort of self-educated at yeah. this point because he's so incredibly well-read now. Um, he's, beca- he's He sort of became – 
in his 30s, this like just completely voracious reader and has read everything. Uh, but yeah, there's that heartbreaking moment when he's, um, I think as he's 15 or 16, and he wins a, torna- wins a tournament and uh, he had, that he had entered as an amateur. And I think there was like a $2,500 uh, pri- prize for it. And he called his dad and he said, what do I do? And his dad said, Andre, you, you're not qualified to do anything else with your life. Take the money. And turn professional, and it was just sort of—it was completely heartbreaking. I mean, imagine being told when you're 16 that you can only do one thing, that you've everything else is gone. You can only do one thing. So yeah, it didn't. I mean, I think he didn't get great messages from it. Um, you know, it it can work. Uh, though I think Maria Sharapova, you know, granted she's got some problems these days with um, mistake with taking that medicine. Um, but I think she, I don't know that she would trade the life she's had for, for, for anything. Um, you know, it, it, it's the, the fact is that there, that if you're going to be an elite athlete these days, you're probably going to have to focus pretty hard on it from a pretty young age. Yeah, no, that part I think is true. Um, and that's the way the world is right now for better, for worse. That's just, uh, that's just reality. Uh, let's talk about the Olympics. Uh, they're coming up here in the United States uh, and elsewhere. Where are they? They're in Brazil this year. They're, the, yeah. I, I think in my mind they're coming up here in the United States because that's where I'm going to watch it. I'm not going to Brazil. Right. Um, but, you know, the interesting thing for me is uh, Michael Phelps, uh, if I'm correct, made this the U.S. swim team. Uh, he did. He's, yeah. an, he's an old man uh, by the historic standards of the sport, a really old man. So talk about how that changed and why it changed. Well, this, I mean, the, you talk about the historic standards of the sport. It, um, I, I think, for a very long time, there was this idea uh, that swimmers peaked in their early twenties, um, and even and women swimmers may, may may even peak even younger than that, uh, and it's completely wrong. Uh, swimmers peak when. Athlete, when every other athlete peaks, which is their mid to late twenties, twenty eight, <laughs> and the right, and the right, and the reason we thought this was because no one dared swim after they were twenty one or twenty two years old because you couldn't make any money doing it. Um, but what? Because you would go to the Olympics, you had to be an amateur. Uh, it was the Mark Spitz story, and you know you won your medals, and then you went to become like a D list actor who was doing guest appearances on you know Emergency and the Love Boat, um, and that was sort of the opportunity that you had. Uh, but what changed was you had a group of athletes um, who got tired of uh, taking seven hundred and fifty dollars or $1,000 or $1,500, or whatever it was, under the table um, from the organizers of events who also happened to be the people who are making the rules saying that they couldn't take any money or be paid as professionals. Uh, and they said, this system is ridiculous. Um, we're working harder than everybody, anybody else. Uh, we want to be paid as professionals. I mean, the person I focus on on this uh, because I think he's so interesting and because he's had such an interesting life was Edwin Moses, uh, the, the great hurdler from the 70s and 80s. Um, who has this unbelievable thing that he did, which was that he didn't lose a race for about 10 years. Uh, the 122 races, his specialty was the uh, 400 meter intermediate hurdles. Um, and I mean, it's astounding what he did, but the only reason he was able to do it was because he got the, he got them to change the rules. And uh it was, he was able to pursue running professional, prof- excuse me, professionally. Uh, he was at the time he won his first gold medal in the Olympics in 1976. Uh, he was at Morehouse College on an academic scholarship because he was pretty slow in high school. But then he had this growth spurt and he did really well. And you know, by the time he was a junior in college, he was the best in the world. By the time he was a junior in college, and then after that, he went to work for General Dynamics as an engineer. And it was the Cold War, and he could, and that, that was really advantageous for him because. General Dynamics had was working three eight-hour shifts designing, you know, weapons and miss, missile systems because they had all these government contracts, and so he would work. He, he was on. He was an engineer on the four to twelve shift, so he would train 
in the morning and early afternoon and then show up at work at four and work till midnight and do it all over the next day. And that got, you know, wouldn't you know, that actually got a little tiring. And so he was agitating and he was really smart and he was, uh, and he was, you know, a gold medal winner. So that always gives you a certain amount of authority. Um, and uh, he, he, he had the good fortune of being, uh, being an athlete at the time when Juan Antonio Samaranch took over the International Olympic Committee. And now Juan Antonio Samaranch has a lot of faults uh, and like to be referred to as, you know, your excellency and uh, was a buddy Don't of Franco. We all. And, Don't yeah, we all. Was, right, exactly. <laughs> was a buddy of Franco. Fault. Right. And, uh, well, maybe you know, not the they, Franco part, but yeah. Right. <laughs> but the one, uh, but the, but one thing he did get, he ended up on the right side of history with, was he realized that in order for the Olympics to survive, there were going to have to be a competition between the best of the best. It was no longer going to be able to survive as a sort of quirky amateur competition because people weren't going to be interested in that. And he and he, he, he set up the system and you know got the enough support. Um, and in working with athletes like Moses, was able to change the rules so that professionals could so that you could be a professional Olympian. And what do you know? When you can be a professional Olympian, you can race for 10 years. You keep training and training hard and making money and race for 10 years and not lose. Or you can be like Michael Phelps and, you know, you can you can break Mark Spitz's record in your third appearance at the Olympics and then come back a fourth time and, you know, become the, the, the most decorated Olympian ever and then come back a fifth time to try, as he's doing now, and try and solidify your legacy and he'll probably pick up another gold medal or two along the way uh, at 31 years old. But it really illustrates the point that, which I, which, you know, runs through your book, which is, again, and not so easy to see, which is this synergy between the attractiveness of the sport, the quality of the play, the amount of money that's in it, which feeds back into the incentive to get better and to be able to market a better product. Obviously, you know, ABC did an amazing job over the years humanizing um, the Olympics. You know, when I think of the Olympics, for better or for worse, I often think of Jim McKay telling some story about some tragedy. Oh, definitely for better. Right? Jim McKay, definitely for no, better. I think he's a giant. But if what he did is— if, if you haven't watched the Jim McKay documentary on HBO, that HBO shows late at night sometimes, make sure to watch it because there's this absolutely priceless moment from, I think, the 1960s where Jim McKay is uh, is is— is is come is announcing the barrel the ice barrel jumping competition from uh, one of the resorts in the Catskill mm-hmm. Mountains and it is as riveting and he is able to make it as riveting as you know the hundred meters uh, the men's hundred meters in, in any Olympics so yes definitely it's, for better with Jim McKay and, and it's all about storytelling and it's all yeah. about the humanizing of the athlete and making. Uh, making you care way beyond the event, way beyond the competition, uh, giving you this visceral, uh, emotional connection to somebody that you've never heard of, that suddenly you're rooting for and caring about. And basically, it's a different product. I think that's the, the most important lesson here. It's that they took something that looks like a game and they made it into a drama in a way that people hadn't thought of before. And that allowed the money to flow in because people cared and that in turn allowed the product to get better and that created more eyeballs, which created more money. And it's, uh, it's to some extent a virtuous circle. Although as, as I think you and other sports fans uh, occasionally lament, it changes things and you don't always, there's there's some downsides to it. Right. And with the Olympics, the important thing also is that, you know, you create all these characters and then you don't kill them. Okay, you don't kill them after one season because that's what they were doing. Yeah, you know, it's not that's Romeo what it and Juliet. They, they, you they, couldn't, <laughs> right? You couldn't afford. I mean, if it, if you take any, imagine if every TV series could only have one season and then you had to have all new characters. That's what the that's what they were trying to do with the Olympics. And the explosion in the value of the TV rights in the Olympics comes when the professionals can come back year after year after year, and it becomes a great TV show because we know these people. Um, 
You know, we know, you know whether it's Michael Phelps or, uh, you know, we're gonna get, you're going to get to know there's a sprinter that's going to run for the U.S. Her name is English Gardner, um, and she's she's got a pretty good chance of, of winning a medal or maybe winning a gold medal. And she's 23 years old, and her parents are ministers from New Jersey. They, she grew up, uh, you know, as... You know, with with barely with two nickels to rub together, and um, you know she's she's 23 years old and she's an Olympic rookie, but she talks like she's you know a 35 year old veteran, and um, you know you're going to start to if she stays healthy, you're going to know her as well as you know as you know your next door neighbor over the next 10 years, and so yeah, that's 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 where. It's that, it's like you said, it's that synergy and, and like, and yes, look, I get it. There are, um, there is that downside. There was something unique about, um, I don't know, the quasi, if the, I hate the word purity, but you know, for lack of a better term, the, the supposed purity, um, but it really wasn't pure. Um, was there, is there purity in a system where the organizers of it are, um, are, are, are pushing a system that essentially artificially uh, keeps down their labor costs and allows them to make uh, money on their side businesses. Right. Um, because it was that's an ugly, it was an ugly, ugly. It's really, it's really an ugly, it's really an ugly system. But the, irony, then, it, the irony of all this, which I think you know, also comes out in your book, and I, I reminded me a little bit of this moment. I forget what book it was. It's Econ Talk guest of long, long ago, maybe back in 08 or 09, where the author was recounting the history of um, a videotape and how horrified movie executives were that people might be able to watch a videotape with somebody else in the room who hadn't paid for it. And they would lose some money that way without realizing that they were on standing on this enormous profit monster that they were holding down foolishly, short-sightedly. And so here are these owners who were keeping down the players, paying them a pittance, uh, you know, the, in baseball, just it's and in football, it's just horrible to, you know, they, they would give them a contract. They had no alternatives. There was no free agency. Uh, they'd have to threaten to, to do something in, instead of playing baseball. It wasn't a very viable threat. The players would. And when that changed, they got everybody got richer. It was just a terrible yeah. mistake on their part to think that somehow they were benefiting from exploiting the athletes. Everybody was losing. Everybody was was missing a chance to, especially the fans, especially the fans, and especially the you know the the owners of of the poorer teams. I mean, for years, you know, Kansas City was basically just a farm team of yep. the New York Yankees. Uh, now Kansas City is the world champions, yep. and you know you, you could complain. Uh, there was all those years of complaining. Oh well, free, that's good. It's going to free agency is going to kill the small market teams. Um, you know, it, it it pushed so much more money into the system and forced forced these 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 franchises um, to operate like real businesses. Uh, that because that was the, what they were going to have to do in order to compete. And yes, a lot of families that had owned these franchises couldn't afford to compete anymore, um, and they had to sell. Uh, but they did pretty well when they sold, and the new people who came in were able to, you know, like it, it's it's in some ways like any other business, in some ways completely different. Um, but that's that's that sort of this idea that um, if you suppress and uh, pay your workers as little as possible and discourage competition, that that's the way to, that's the road to success. Um, I don't know where exactly that uh, we got that idea, but uh, you know, time and again, it shows us in, in industry to industry. Um, it seems not to be true. So let's, let's turn to Nike. Um, I'm recording this, um, in the summer, I come out to Stanford uh, to the West Coast office of the Hoover Institution, and I'm about – I'm probably about 500, maybe 400 yards from um, the Knight Management Center, K-N-I-G-H-T, named after Phil Knight, who made a rather substantial gift to Stanford's Graduate School of Business. And you know, we just sort of take this for granted that Nike is this incredibly wealthy company, but – 
If you'd gone back to, say, 1970 or so, when he was first getting started, when Nike was first getting started in the, what, the late 70s, can you imagine saying that one of the most successful sports companies and businesses in the world is going to sell sneakers? Uh, it's uh, – I, I don't understand how they pulled it. I still ha- – I'm somewhat mystified by how they have identified uh, success with shoes. Uh, you know, when you think of all the things that could have been different uh, or why it would work at all, it's um, – I, I am. it amazes me. Well, what they – I mean, you, you, you said had built this massive success over selling shoes. Um, what they realized, uh, and, you know, Phil Knight has talked about this, is that what they – that their main product was selling stories. You know, at some – you know, essentially it's at, at, at probably shortly around the time of Michael Jordan – uh, in the mid '80s, and you know the the Michael Jordan boom into the late '80s, they realized that they were not so much an equipment company, but a marketing company. Um, that that's uh, the that that's where their 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 main strength was. And yes, they do put a tremendous amount of money into research and development. And yes, they do uh, create good <laughs> products. Good they, you know, they do For create sure. some good yeah, yeah some good products. Good shoes. But, you know, but a lot of people create, a lot of people make good shoes. Yeah. Um, but what they, what they understood before anyone else did um, was that it wasn't so much about the shoe, uh, that it was about what that swoosh represented and the people that they could get that, that, that they could get to wear that, uh, wear that shoe and, and the story that they could tell and the sort of legend that they could spin um, about that person. And sometimes it works really well. It's worked more often than not. And sometimes it works famously horribly. Um, and, you know, we know those stories do well, too. The most famous of them, I guess, you know, would be Lance Armstrong, um, where uh, they, you know, where they create this whole campaign about an athlete that was basically a complete farce. Um, but, you know, but what you get back to ultimately is uh, how they changed. And, and once again, we're talking about that, you know, that relationship between what happens off the field and what happens on the field, sort of how they changed um, the sort of emphasis uh, that different athletes put on different aspects of their career and what really became important um, to a lot of athletes is not so much, you know, how many championships I've won or exactly how many points I've scored or how I can help my team and all those things. But what's my story here? Um, you know, and again, you go back to Michael Jordan. Sometimes the story is true. Sometimes the story is not so true. Uh, you know, you go back to the famous story that everyone thinks they know about Michael Jordan that he got cut from his high school basketball team. Um, he, he didn't actually really get cut from his high school basketball team. He just didn't make varsity as a freshman, which is an entirely normal thing to happen, even to really good basketball well, I think he was players short. who haven't, his, his well, yeah, who haven't hit their like, growth spurt yeah. yet. Right, he just played JV as a freshman, and then the next, and then grew, and then the, and then was a superstar by the time he was a sophomore. But it sounds much better if you say he got cut from his high school basketball team, and you know struggled against the adversity, and came back from defeat, and the legend begins to grow. Um, you know, and so then, and and you know, they say, oh well, what's the difference there? Well, the difference becomes when you become addicted to the legends, and you become. And and so then there are certain legends that become irresistible, like Lance Armstrong beating cancer and coming back to win the Tour de France. And you know, so what do you do? You make a commercial that says, you know, what am I on? I'm on my bike six hours a day. When you know, the truth is that he's on a lot of other things besides his bike six hours a day. Uh, and that's where the danger comes in. And I think that's the part. Um, where we get most irritated uh, in sports and like in every other aspect of life, you know, you know what? People don't really like to be lied to or um, they don't like to be sort of made fools of or had have, have things pulled over on them. And I, I, when, I, have to, I have to interrupt because, you know, we're not going to name any names, but it is 
uh, July and November 2016 is coming soon. And somehow people <laughs> managed to – they're going to vote for a bunch of people who are going to lie to them uh, a yeah. lot. So it, it I think I, I would take a different tack. I would say that you know lying to us in sports is somewhat harmless, somewhat harmless. You know, the fact that Michael Jordan really didn't do X, Y, or Z is – Maybe not the worst thing in the world. Even Lance Armstrong. I mean, it's an incredible Shakespearean tragedy, the whole thing. And he humiliated his friends who lied you know, to him. And he made a lot of money dishonestly. True. Um, but if it hadn't come to light that he was a cheater, uh, a lot of people would have been happy, would have used that as a motivation, would have inspired people. You know, it's a little bit, it's a little bit like, you know, fairy tales, literally, right? These are fairy tales that they're morality tales that, have sometimes an unhappy ending and we learn a different lesson from it. Um, I just find it fascinating that that you can spin those stories to the extent that you can get people to pay that much money for for a shoe and and why it's a shoe and not something else. You know, obviously athletes endorse lots of products, but somehow the fact that it's used in you – know, if I had to think about why Nike is successful, there aren't many things as a non-athlete I can do – and be like Mike as a basketball player. Yeah, I can I can drink his Gatorade or whatever it is, or I can uh, drive the car he endorses. But if I wear his basketball shoes, it's kind of like I'm like him, really, as a basketball player. Or if I use you know the racket that that um, uh, Sampras uses or whatever. Or, oh God, you're gonna break your arm if you use yeah. Sampras' racket. It's like <laughs> so heavy. <laughs> That's the crazy that that old Wilson is the, is the worst racket. I don't know. Why, ever, I don't know why feels like name, a meat cleaver. I don't know why his name came to mind. But anyway, I just think it's uh, the ability. You know, I guess the other the consumer version of this is Coca Cola. So Coca Cola is a it's a good tasting soft drink. There are a lot of decent tasting soft drinks that are water and sugar and a little bit more. But it created something else, a feeling, an aura, a brand that's that's different. And Apple has done that, right? It's 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 hard to understand why some make it and some don't and why some are successful and some aren't. I don't know. Yeah, I think – I mean, I, 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 and, I, and if you get, you get back to Nike, I mean, they made it because they had really cool commercials. Yeah. They had great – they just did great – I mean, and you can name five of them. You, made, you mentioned the uh, – I mean, it was a Gatorade commercial you mentioned with Michael Jordan, but um, – you know, those great they they had Spike Lee directing their commercials in the in the nineteen eighties, um, in this sort of edgy way. They were telling these they were just telling these great these great stories of inspiration while everyone else was talking about um it, it was talking about the you know, the, the great technical the, the great molded soul or something like that. Um you know, it's it's it, it, maybe it's the difference between prose and poetry, or it's the difference between, uh, you know, there's that old that old it, when Democrats used to lose a lot of national elections. Um, you know, I used to read read about how uh, it was because they would it was because they would, they thought that if they if they use that they could that a progressive or a Democrat could well, always thought that he could he could logically explain to a voter why they should vote for them, whereas the people who are really good at running these campaigns would inspire them, um, would, would, would talk about big ideas like freedom and things like that. You, you wouldn't get into the logic so much. Uh, and in terms of why Nike was, why someone like Nike was successful is because they were, you know, they were, they were talking about big things. They were talking about dreams and just do it and getting off your couch and, you know, let everybody else, uh, you know, try and you know tell me about the technical aspects of why this shoe might might make you go faster when it really doesn't. Yeah, it's just hard to understand why telling somebody to just do it, it makes me want to buy their shoe. But um, it, it it's working. Um, it, uh, it has <laughs> it, it has it has worked for it has worked for a long time. Um, so we're almost and, and, we're almost out of time. Um, I want you to reflect on something that's not in your book, which is you know you're. Uh, you're a great writer. You, um, I'd say I'm a great rewriter. Yeah, you're, you're a great writer. You saw my raw copy. But it's a phenomenal thing that in 2016, there are a lot of people who can make a living writing about sports. There are a lot of people 
who spend immense amounts of time thinking about sports as a leisure activity. So when I think about when the fall comes and fantasy football comes along, uh, the fantasy football season, the amount of hours that Americans spend uh, playing fantasy football and paying attention to their draft and watching their teams and looking for trades and all – just it's it's an incredible statement about our wealth as a as a as a country. The amount of time we spend watching a twenty four seven sports channel, reading about on the web all the statistics of all these players across all sports. This is another aspect of sports that has so changed. You know, when I was a kid, I looked at the box scores. I learned what uh, players hit in their careers. I loved baseball statistics. But today, kids know, and adults, such an immense range of stuff about so many sports. And I just find that uh, a different aspect of this transformation that that we haven't talked about. So uh, close us out by reflecting on that. Well, I mean, I do think sports still has, when sports work, um, they have a way of sort of uh, inspiring us um, and may make us think about what's possible in a way uh, that in a way that nothing else does, um, you know, you get back to the Olympics, uh, you know, which are coming up. Um, the Olympics are a lot of different things. They're, you know, they're kind of over commercialized and they're a spectacle and they're a TV thing, um, you know, but at their root is this really big idea Um which is that the Olympics is essentially a peace movement, um, and that, and that's that's sort of how it was founded originally. And the importance of that part of it, I think, is still there today, and is part of the reason why um, why we're kind of attracted to it. There's a big idea behind it, and the idea is that you know there's a lot of problems in the world, and there's a lot of countries that fight with each other. But if for 70 days, every two years or four years, you know, if it depends on how you measure the summer or the winter, um, a few thousand athletes, or in the case of the Summer Olympics, 10,000 athletes can live in the same village and eat in the same dining room and compete on the same uh, field of competition, um, maybe the world can become a better place. And every basketball game and every baseball game doesn't, have that overtly, but there's some sort of larger idea to it, uh, you know, whether it's beauty or whether it's something very elemental um, or simply fairness or, like you said, uh, you know, there's there's much less racism in it now because of lots of other different aspects to it, to, to the sports. Um, you know, there, there's an ability for as much as these things can irritate us, uh, they can make us feel like, um, you know, there's something larger going on there and they can not, not just, um, not just build character, but also reveal character, uh, in ways that other activities simply can't. And, um, it's neat to watch the people who are, it's neat to have the ability to watch the people who are the best ever at these things their traits and when they do it well uh, and when they do it with a sort of grace um, and humility uh, it's 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 a special thing my guest today has been Matthew Futterman his book is players Matt thanks for being part of econ talk oh thanks so much for having me it's uh, it's been great This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.